Jazz Station on the Palouse, 89.9 KJ. Okay. I hadn't heard from you. I told him I'd take it if it needed me to. Good afternoon. Uh, today is Monday, June 23rd. It's 3 p.m. and this is the um, City of Moscow Administrative Committee. Uh, my name is Tom Lamar. I'm the chair of the committee. And uh, with us today are both Wayne Krauss and John Weber, uh, also council members, and um, Gary Reedner, our city supervisor. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the May 12th minutes. I move we approve. Second that. Okay, we'll approve those minutes. The next item on the agenda is the Latah County Library District Lease Renewal. And we have Tom Grundon here to talk about our lease renewal. Good afternoon and thank you, Tom. Uh, as you just stated correctly, the uh, City of Moscow and the Latah County Library District uh, have a 10-year lease that's expiring this September 30th and the Library Board would like to renew the lease for another 10-year period effective October 1st of this fall uh, under the same terms and conditions as were presented in the previous 10-year lease. Uh, City Attorney Hall modified some of the language to clean the document up to a certain point and no other terms or conditions have changed and are not uh, considered for the renewal. So uh, just simply said they're requesting a new lease for a 10-year period. Yes, John. Gary, did you have something? Well, I've got a couple things to add. Um, okay, the I'll let you have Gary first. Then. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um, the language that Rod changed had to do with uh, mostly indemnification. Uh, Walter Steed had emailed and indicated that um, there's nothing in the recitals about the city actually owning the library building, so we could certainly throw that in. That's not a huge issue. Unless Rod has an issue with I think it. we've got Rod coming can, up, too. If I can just address that part sure. on the ownership. Okay, please, Rod. On the second page on Article 6, mm -hmm. it talks about no ownership being given to the library. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's implied that the city has the ownership, and this is a lease agreement, um, but you could always change it to add in. Could we put a recital in there? We could probably put in a recital at the beginning of whereas okay. the city owns the... Um, okay. Yeah, that's the probably building the, and wishes to leash it to the. It's probably a good way to district. start. Yeah, and, and as the council knows, this uh, building is owned by the city. When the library district was formed in the early 90s, uh, our agreement with the library district was they could house their headquarters here, continue to use it as a library. We have an agreement with them that's in place now that uh, dictates capital uh, improvements, maintenance, and those sorts of things. And right. Tom's crew, and in the budget you, this year, you'll see that they're, well, we just finished a library project last year yep. on the entrance. Yes, yes. front and, entrance. And this year, there's a proposal to redo the sandstone correct. and point the bricks, correct? That is correct. And we also put new oh, HVAC okay. roofs, uh, units on the roof last year as well. So the city's made significant improvements to the building. It's a nice place. I used to be a janitor there. Oh, did you? Really? <laughs> Long time ago. Did you read any books while you were there? I did. But mostly I cleaned. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Got all the way up to third grade reading level. Yeah, that's right. It was fun. It was a good time. Um, well, I think I have not. John was going to ask a question. Actually, I wasn't going to ask. I was just going to say this sounds like a very reasonable thing to do, and I'm in favor of it. Okay. That sounds good. And that, by the way, as a way of introduction, I, that masked man who came up here and ran away, that was Rod Hall, the city attorney. Did you have anything more to no, add, Wayne? This is pretty much housekeeping. Okay. It's working well, the partnership, we'll just move on with it. I, and I think it's good that we're adding the the, the, uh, the whereas clause on the ownership. I think that's so assumed. I'll have that but <laughs> inserted in for the next CCSR, Gary. Sounds good. That'd be great. great. We can move it forward. I'm happy with it going to consent if we can. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the next item on the agenda is proposed amendment to the Moscow City Code Title 7, Chapter 7, Fire Prevention to adopt the International Fire Code 2012 edition with modifications for, as presented by Joe Williams. I'm sorry, Tom. Did you indicate you wanted this to go to consent? I did. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Hey, how are you doing? Pretty good. And... Dave Reynolds. 
more support. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the state fire marshal uh, adopts the International Fire Code, IFC, as a minimum standard for the entire for the entire state pursuant Idaho Code 41253. Um, many believe that the IFC is a maintenance document when, in fact, it's a design document. You guys have probably seen times when I interact with plan reviews where um, we need water supply, fire department access, and required protection systems. And uh, buildings cannot be constructed without this input. Um, the fire code establishes minimum regulations for firefighter safety, uh, fire protection systems, and the safe storage and use of hazardous materials. I brought a book. If you guys kind of want to thumb through this, I'll show you what I do. I look through the significant changes instead of just going to the fire code and trying to weed this out, weed this process out to make sure that I understand what the important changes are to the fire code and how they affect the city of Moscow, the firefighters, um, in that respect. Um, I've, some of the, some of the significant changes that are in that book I'd like to talk to you about, and there's a lot of them, but three of them that, that mean something, uh, important. One of them is obstructions on roofs. A lot of times firefighters are up on top of roofs doing roof operations for whatever reason. Um, and the new code uh, developed a, and established a criteria for roof obstructions, which is guy wires. Um, and they're arranged so emergency responders are not accidentally injuring these, themselves on these. There are some height restrictions, and you can take a look in there if you, if you wanted to. In Section 316.4, it would tell you exactly what that's talking about. Um, and if I'm going too fast, let me know. Um, another one is traffic calming devices. We've got two of those coming up here in the city, uh, both uh, one on 6th Street and one on Deacon. And, and then the new code allows me to have input on how these are constructed so my fire trucks are able to get over them when they get done. We're, there's a lot of construction going on at the U of I, and that's where all this has taken place. And I, I work with the Deputy State Fire Marshal, former Chief Don Strong, on this, on these for access to the buildings. The new IRIC that they're building is, um, we've had a, a quite a bit of conversation about access to this building and and the fact that they uh, helped us pay for the ladder truck, 50%, is that right, Gary? It is. Yeah, that they need to be able, we need to be able to get our ladder truck in there and use it, you know, uh, to protect their buildings. Um, another one that I deal with quite a bit is discontinuation of, of chain or of service. And that's a lot of times we'll have people that um, will quit paying their bill or change service on monitoring system for fire alarms have a have a problem and we find out that they don't have a, a monitoring service anymore and that's very important to us to get us dispatched properly now there's there's more to this more minor changes um, the changes that we're making to the city code I try to wait until the building official has worked on that to a point where he, there's, there's lots of areas in the fire code and the building code that mirror each other. So my, I make my changes after they make their changes if I'm in agreement with them to um, make sure that the, the, wor the codes both read the same. Um, and I've listed a few of those. So um, there's also in, in the city code, we're doing some housekeeping duties that because the the changes in the in the 2012 code reflect different sections that used to be in the 2009 that were reported in the city code, so we had to get those all in line. Um, and I guess that's about it. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, I, I think uh, having read the draft document here um, that we will be enacting and your okay with this yes and uh, 
having read it, it makes uh, pretty good sense to me, uh, someone that really doesn't know a lot about what you do other than that you do it well mm -hmm. as far as the uh, fire department. And I appreciate that. So um, this was a collaborative effort with Rod and myself to try and make sure that this document was correct. Uh, so well, I'm yes, in Gary. favor of it. So There have been some, as you know, there have been some... Uh, concerns about state codes applying to the city and making perhaps building a little difficult. So um, might I suggest this go on the regular agenda and we'll put together a presentation so that the public can understand the changes from the previous fire or the current fire code to the one adopted by the state, the modern fire code, and then uh, the changes that you're suggesting, Joe. If there were certain things that the city did not want to adopt from the state code, what would be the ramifications of that? Um, Fire rating? Could be. Um, I guess we can't be less restrictive than what the state adopts. So it's the same as all so, state regulations. We have to, we cannot be any less restrictive. Under address identification, it talks about new and existing buildings shall be provided with approved numbers or letters. This tells me that every structure in this city that has an address on it has to be in compliant with four inch by half inch wide letters. And if they're not, how do we enforce that? How do we get that changed? Well, um, my fire inspector is working diligently on that process. Uh, also, uh, the building department is doing the same thing. We're started with the malls, and uh, we're when when somebody reports to us that there isn't an address because we actually, you know, we don't know for sure. Then we uh, remind the the business owners that that's what they need to do, and and it's a, a simple, cheap fix. Sure, you can buy letters for three or four dollars. Yeah, but my my thoughts on that, Joe, are, are in the residential areas on houses, homes that have been built in the 50s, 60s, 70s that might have three inch letters for their address number and not not compliant with a four inch. What do we do about forcing that change? Because that's part of the code now. Well, uh, that's a good question. The the uh, Private residents are tougher to police than, and, and I guess we can mention that to them when we see that, or someone can be in touch with my office to. So we're not going to make a concerted effort to go door to door telling people they have to change I, your address. We have not numbers. done that. No. Then the last part of that, then I think that's all I had, was it also said that um, talks about reflective when required by fire code official address numbers shall be provided in additional locations and reflective so uh -huh. that reflective uh, I, I would assume that we're not talking about your average residence has to have reflective numbers necessarily not that I know of no this strikes me as more like if somebody lives in a lane and then you've got to have at the main where the driveway comes and meets the highway they would want to have reflective numbers there so people can see what the address was that's actually, how I kind of interpreted that. Yeah, our rural fire department has actually implemented a, a program where they're installing um, address signs for free for our rural. In blue community. background with white letters. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And yeah. and it's as much for EMS as it is for fire. Yeah, those are handy. Gary. Well, one other question that I yeah. had was on automatic fire sprinklers. Uh, it says that uh, the, an exception is an automatic fire sprinkler is not required in group R containing two units or less. I'm assuming this is apartments, and if if we're building new apartments and they're more, they're three units or more, they've got to have a sprinkler system. Uh, um, that's keeping the the code from forcing people to put sprinklers in single family dwellings and duplexes that are separated by a firewall. They do not have to have them. Those are one and two family dwellings. Anything more than that has to have a sprinkler system. What about our townhouses and things like that? Townhouses are not required. To They're know. not required. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say there's, a, and the city attorney can certainly chime in if he'd like. Um, 
on life safety issues, if the fire department or inspectors run across a violation of a life safety code, um, and they've integrated the life safety code into the international fire code, the international building code, so on and so forth, and we used to have a separate code for that. Those are things like having a window that's too small in a basement bedroom. Those have to be mitigated or the bedroom can't be used for that, or if they see electrical issues or anything that could cause a hazard. I would think that the letter issue that you're talking about would be applied prospectively to new construction, and certainly we'd like people to comply with it, but I think the fire department, building department, uh, police, if the letters are legible and the house can be identified, then they don't make an issue out of it. Is that correct? That's correct. So, um, again, life safety is a little different than some of the other prospective right. portions of the code. Well, and I was expecting to have this on the regular agenda anyway, okay. since it's an ordinance. But um, so I think it would be great because it would give the department a chance to come and. And you're exactly right. It is speak. an ordinance. I missed that. Yeah. Well, I, th I thought that was the case. So. That's reason you get the big money. That's yeah, right. that's right. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I'd like to see us move this forward and and have a have Joe do the presentation for everybody to hear, Thank or you. somebody from the department. It could be Dave too. Joe's the expert on this. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. All right. Thanks, so uh, now we're on to reports. And I don't care if they're in the order as listed. So that would mean that the first one would be the High Five Passport Program with Jordan Tracy. Is that correct? Okay. Thanks, Jordan. We'll start there. Thanks, Gary. I got a lot of paraphernalia here. Oh, my gosh. I'm... I'd love to borrow that uh, that that IFC book that we looked at up here at some point. Not right now. It could oh, be I later. Have, I have a spare. You book. do? Okay. I just wanted to look at it and then uh, just can't get it have back the one to you. With all my notes in it. No, I won't do that. <laughs> and Tom, there's usually one in my office. There, you have trouble sleeping at night. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Oh, there's one one piece that I wanted to read read up on. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Okay. So. Jen Piffner, you're not yes, on here, but I am not on I will. I'd just like to introduce uh, Jordan Tracy. She's our intern working with us on the High Five Grant Program. Um, Great. This is the program you've seen. Hold on, we're a little shorter. Um, program you've seen um, over the past oh, six to eight months that is um, working with the Blue Cross Foundation of Idaho, the High Five Program. Um, we came up with a passport program, which Jordan can talk a little bit about and let you know the activities we've done thus far in the summer and give you an update on that. But Thank you. she'll be with us through October and wanted to introduce her. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So we've just completed our first official month of the program. So we've gone through um, the main components. We've distributed over 320 passports to kids. So that means over 320 kids have picked them up and are currently participating. Um, at the beginning of June, we had our first um, fruit and vegetable tasting, which had a pretty good turnout. And then on June 14th, we had our first fruit and vegetable cooking class, which was held in the market, and they made um, vegetable roll-ups <laughs> with the help of the campus dietitian from U of I. We had about 20 kids for that. And then this past Saturday, we had our first activity class held in the market, and kids got to jump rope and hopscotch and good old school games to get them moving. And that had um, 21 participants. And then every weekend since June and through the entirety, through the entire program, they have um, the opportunity to get a stamp for biking and walking to the market. So that's going on consistently. Um, those are the main components. And we've made it through our first month, and we're looking forward to continuing on with it. That sounds fun. Right? Yeah. Sounds good. That's great. Well, well, thank you. I need thank a I need a put passport so I can get a little stamp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy. Nice meeting you. Nice to meet you. Okay. The next uh, report that we have is the Fort Russell Reconnaissance Survey Status Report with Mike Ray. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. 
Well, I just wanted to uh, brief the council on a ongoing project that we currently have within Community Development and the Historic Preservation Commission, and that is the uh, Fort Russell Reconnaissance Survey. Re so just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Historic Preservation Commission received two CLG grants, which stands for Certified Local Government, and those are issued through the Idaho State Historical Society. So in 2013-2014, we received these grants uh, for the Fort Russell Reconnaissance Survey Project. We had, ended up selecting AD Preservation, which is based out of Spokane, Washington, uh, and they were awarded the contract basically for $11,000 <coughs> with 50% match uh, coming from the City or the Historic Preservation Commission. Ended up with a start date of November of last year uh, to start on the project with an anticipated completion date of August 30th, 2014, and they need to have it completed by that date uh, in order to satisfy our C CLG grant requirements. So looking at the, the area, uh, just to orient yourself here, we have the existing Fort Russell Historic District outlined in red. So that currently contains 116 properties. We also have the Fort Russell, this is the reconnaissance survey area. So basically everything within the blue, also including the existing historic district, will be surveyed uh, as part of the reconnaissance survey work. And so you may ask yourself, well, why does it extend all the way down to 6th Street here? Why is it so far out of the periphery of the existing district? Well, uh, we asked ourselves the same question when we were looking at uh, you know, maybe what the anticipated boundary would be for the reconnaissance survey, ended up looking at plat maps within that area. And so uh, if you look at this, you have about three subdivision plats platted in the late 1800s uh, that encompass portions of the district. And so you've got Russell First Edition uh, down here in the green, and that was platted in 1881. You have Russell Second Edition with a school, uh, basically platted in, and the, the plat doesn't have an ending number on it, so it's 1880-something, probably 82 or 83. And you also have the park edition in light blue uh, with this L-shaped boundary here, which also includes East City Park. And so I think it, it made sense to us to extend it all the way down here because basically you have these platted subdivisions uh, that transect through the existing original district boundary, uh, that were maybe developed at the same time a lot of the homes in the district were developed at. And so that's really the reason for that proposed survey boundary. So I'm sorry to interrupt. Mike, why, why wouldn't it then, why wouldn't the blue line match up with the edge of the addition boundaries? I mean, exactly. Like, so it goes over another block or some, or half a block. Well, up here, you know, there's a clear line to tell you that we have apartments, you know, oh, built okay. built up in this corner. Okay. So obviously, those aren't going to be in the Fort Russell so Historic District. Okay. And so, so you have fine. this, yeah, topographical line in that northwest corner. That's why it's this really, you know, zigzag pattern uh, in that northwest area. You also have uh, Dead Man's Hill up there on Adams Street. And it includes that piece over there that's not in it because there might have been something that was happening there before or as the addition was being made correct okay and you also I, I guess also to note the original Fort Russell stockade was not even in the district uh, it was just to the south of st. Mary's here Hi. so that was a you know another item that factored into our decision of where to you know, include that area. So basically you have 116 properties uh, within the existing district and about 450 that are going to be surveyed on the periphery of the district. And this will also help us kind of decide, you know, maybe there's another historic district that could start uh, further on outside of uh, this area. So looking at the survey area, once again, 116 sites. Uh, 1980 was the original National Register listing. Uh, that's when it was first put on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, looking at the periphery, got about 450 sites. So uh, basically, as part of this project, we have two phases. One, the first phase is within the district. Uh, the second phase is on the periphery. And so uh, we've completed, or our, I should say our consultants completed phase one. And they completed that about a month ago. And so it's a large, inch-thick document, but basically, We'll go over some of the things they had taken a look at within this phase one report. Uh, the first ones, you know, they had taken a look at sandboard insurance maps, and these are from the early 1900s, about 1900 and 1928. 
And uh, this is the excerpt for that the consultant discusses here. The sandboard maps are particularly valuable in assisting the consultants in determining the age of the buildings, as well as additions or notable alterations, and are further valuable in visibly demonstrating development and growth trends throughout the survey area. And so uh, basically that's what these insurance maps look like. So you can see this one's from December of 1904. You have the city basically divided up into quadrants, and then they have uh, larger maps within those areas. And so this is one of those areas on, uh, you know, number 17. And so you can see the originally platted lots, and you can also see building footprints. And so this assists the consultant in, uh, you know, verifying when additions were done, uh, if it matches the original footprint of the building, uh, and so forth. This is, uh, they had got done with the, the uh, survey of the existing district, and these, the red boxes basically, or the red numbering, uh, basically represents uh, structures that are contributing to the historical character of the district. Uh, the blue ones represent uh, structures, properties that are non-contributing to the historic character of the district, and it, it means just like it sounds. So, you know, basically if you're red, uh, you could potentially be, or you may already be, uh, basically on the National Register of Historic Places as a contributing building within the Fort Russell Historic District. And so this is their recommendation. You know, this isn't as it currently exists as far as the configuration of nonconforming to contributing. Uh, this is just what they found when they went out there and surveyed these properties. So this is what it looks like uh, when they look at each individual property. You know, it taken two pictures, one from kind of the front at an angle and one from a, a side if they can get it. And basically has uh, the building site number, which correlates to the map here. You also have the address, uh, the previous district uh, determination, which uh, the C represents contributing. Uh, this survey, they would be recommending uh, this one be contributing as well. And it gives a narrative about uh, the details of the, the house that's on that property. You can see it's pretty pretty great detail on each one. So they do a really thorough analysis on each of those properties. Uh, they also use some of these uh, archive photos from Lataw County Historical Society uh, to compare. And so that's basically the same Butterfield house there. Uh, a few things have changed. You know, you can this top that was on uh, the Mason Cornwall, Nels Reese's house. They had some kind of turret or something like this on the top that they had removed. I, surprising to see a widow's walk in Moscow, Idaho, considering what the origin of those were. I don't know the origin of them. The origin of them? Mm -hmm. Back in the old seafaring days when they overlooked the ocean? Yeah. And they were watching for their husbands to come home in their sailing vessels, and when the, when the vessel didn't come, the widow was walking, watching. Okay. Well, the, I was told. some of the early, uh, it makes sense, some of the early... Uh, homes like Nels's the, or the Reese's residence uh, used to have those up there to spot Native Americans you know during that time and so some of the early books okay, uh, would give a narrative about you know watching the migration over in the distance so I, I think that that was probably what it was for just another example <laughs> and that was the, wow. the picture from back in the day there that's cool roof yeah pattern and that was the Shields house there. That's really neat. Mm. So just to go over what uh, the consultant found within uh, the phase one here, basically the district's significance. So they found there to be two signifying uh, cri basically criteria. The first <laughs> one's architecture. And what, basically what they stated is that it represents a rich display of early residential architecture. There's also a historical element to that. So, and that's significant for the historical connections between the houses and many of the people that built the town. So you hear a lot of the houses referred to, like for the one we just sh had shown up there, the Shields house, you know, Dr. So-and-so's house. You know, usually it's prominent Llewellyn, you know, Asbury, all these prominent founders of Moscow. Uh, that's really, you know, where the names come from is that they were first, they either built the house or they first lived in that house. So, once again, we had the original listing, which contained 116. 
the consultant discovered there were actually 117 structures uh, within the historic district. So we had a little bit of an error in the original nomination. And one site was listed twice. So basically we have about 115 documented sites within the district instead of the 116 uh, which we originally thought. We're, so currently we have 70 sites which are contributing to the historic character. We have seven sites which are non-contributing. But we also have this other category which they said that uh, this National Register nomination was the only nomination that they saw this uh, criteria listed or this category listed and they had non-contributing uh, with parentheses compatible. And so I think that assumes that, you know, within the next 10, 15 years from that 1980 mark, uh, they would be compatible with the district. But right now they don't meet the 50-year mark. And so before it was pretty, you know, that was pretty cut and dry. If you were over 50 years, then you were eligible for a National Register listing. If you were under 50 years, uh, well, you're not eligible. And they have a little bit more flexibility nowadays in determining uh, whether or not it's eligible for the National Register. So basically, we had 60% of the buildings within the district contributing. So looking at our, our phase one report, we have 91 which could be contributing to the district. And we have 24, uh, which are basically identified as non-contributing by the consultant. So that brings our total contributing up to 79% from the 60% we previously had. And some of the reasons why this disparity is, is uh, the 50-year cutoff was 1930. And so all the homes that were built uh, after 1930 uh, basically weren't included, even if they were consistent with the district. And so you have the bungalows, Colonial Revival, uh, and other styles basically hitting that 50-year mark. So uh, what we can expect with Phase 2, uh, surveying the periphery of the district, uh, basically a further evaluation of the areas surrounding an evaluation of the overall historic context of the area. I think that's probably one of the larger uh, issues we'll take a look at, as well as uh, details and recommendations regarding any potential expansion of the district boundaries. And that's what our consultant will provide us within phase two of the reconnaissance survey. So I uh, just wanted to brief the council, but uh, I'd certainly stand for any questions that you might have about this project. Do you have questions? I really enjoy hearing reports like this because it's fun to see how some of these homes have changed over time. Yeah. And, I, and sometimes I, how they've stayed so similar. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the only question I had was uh, for the non-conforming ones, but or non-contributing, non but like, did you say consistent or? Uh, that, yeah. Non-contributing. Compatible. compatible. That's the word. Could it also be those those places that were later constructed in the same style, but not necessarily, you know, not hitting the 50-year mark, 50 mark one way or the other, but um, being built, but sort of to try to try to. I think they were all around the same, you know, the similar <laughs> styles to what the ones we have in the district. I think it was the 50-year mark. Not so the 50-year mark is the big thing. That yeah, I think the 50-year mark was the thing. You know, that's why it created that nonlinear zigzaggy right. line that creates the district right now. I think he also had some misinformation about uh, people not wanting to be in the district for various reasons and, and those could certainly account for some of the ones that are maybe not contributing could, but could be compatible. Uh, maybe they were you know, misinformed about what the National Register district, you know, what being on the National Register means. You know, it doesn't mean that uh, you can't paint your house a certain color. Uh, it's basically just an honor, not really an obligation. You know, you could tear your house down tomorrow if you wanted to, if you were, uh, you know, listed on the National Register within the district. So there's really no special requirements. It's more of just an honor uh, for our city and for those homeowners within the, the district. Proud making moment. Yes, Wayne. So, as the city is aging, we've got a lot of neighborhoods now that are approaching that 50-year. When you look at north, north section of town, houses that were built in the 50s, even in the early 60s, have hit that 50-year mark. So what happens if, say that, some of those neighborhoods say, well, we want to be a historical district. Yeah. What do we do? Well, I think it's up to, uh, you know, the people, of the citizens and the council and the city of Moscow to decide whether or not we want other historic districts. But like you said, 
Um, everybody thinks that, you know, historic is in the 30s and the 20s and the 40s, but now it's, you know, reaching that 50-year mark, so you're starting to get, you know, some of the ones in the 60s, you know, 50s, 60s, the, the ranchers, you Right, know. this is just the Fort Russell. Yeah. But we could have Swede Town. Sure. Historic district, and that was whatever the other thought. Be. You know, I mean, if we're going to expand it, and that's something that the consultant will be able to tell us that well, we're starting to see a pattern as you head further south, maybe between Third and Sixth Street, that may be the makings of another historic district. So, you know, that's something else we'll have to take a look at. It's pretty fun stuff. Yeah. Well, thanks. And with uh, the action that we did a month or two ago when we named Lato County Historical Society as our city um, historian. Does that affect how this Well, proceeds? the action of the council was you wanted that, uh, that was a $5,000 proposal. You directed that that be considered in the budget. That was not approved oh, by so council Oh, so we haven't finished that. Okay. No. Okay. I thought. But right. if, if the council decides to go with that, um, then the city historian piece of it doesn't take the place of the work um, that we're doing on the work that we're doing okay. it's more of a um, I guess a living history if Record you will keeping. not the structures and that sort of thing okay thanks well thanks so much Mike yeah definitely. yeah okay so the next report that we have is the big belly trash compactor pilot project that sounds like fun. that sounds exciting <laughs> And exciting. Tim Davis and Big Belly, by that, we're referring to the trash compactor, not any particular. It's not a personal thing. Not a personal <laughs> thing. We're okay, thanks. <clears throat> thanks. Four of the five people here are historic. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I could I get on the historic uh, register? I'm, 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 I'm 50. I'm, I'm don't plus even 50. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, re nice. Recently, the uh, <clears throat> sanitation fund purchased four of these Big Belly solar compacting units. Um, the Parks Department um, installed those about a week, week and a half ago. Um, and they will also be servicing them um, periodically like they do the rest of the receptacles in the downtown area. But um, the locations where these were um, put in if you haven't seen them yet we've got one on the east side of Maine down at Friendship Square just out from the fountain there was a second one downtown on the west side of Maine where 5th Street intersects um, we put one out at the new transit center and then we put one at the bus shelter on Deacon near 6th Street intersection where the St. Augustine's Church is there's a bus shelter out in front of there and the idea behind this pilot project was to um, try to save some fuel and staff time while eliminating, um, you know, having receptacles every 20 feet. These things will take the place of four to six regular receptacles. Um, of course, they're solar powered, so the compactor unit's powered by a battery that's charged by the solar unit, and it's got a little reader in there. When it becomes so full, it automatically compacts. Um, and along with these, on um, three of the four of them, we, we purchased the uh, recycling receptacle t to go along with them so folks would have a place to throw their drink containers and so forth. Do you have anything to Tim, you want to talk about the automatic notifications? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This comes with a software, too, that... Um, it sends alerts. It's actually got three stages. It's kind of like a stoplight. It's got a green, a yellow, and a red. So the first alert goes out, or under normal operations, it will run under the green light. So there's no alert set. Once it begins to get full, like 70 to 80 percent full, it'll throw out an alert and say, okay, we're at our yellow section now. And then when it becomes totally full, that's when we need to get it picked up. But um, the yellow kind of gives gives the folks a, a time frame where they don't have to stop what they're doing to go empty it, but they know that it's getting there. So, How is that alert communicated to staff? Um, it is through, uh, through their smartphones. Um, and then we also have an administrative person, which will probably be Tom Grundon, that will kind of have an oversight over the whole um, software system but the folks out in the field get a get an alert on their smartphone and so so is the plan that at some point we will uh, replace other garbage cans <coughs> in the downtown area say with these 
compactors so that yeah, if these we've work got a out, consistent and this is what the council wants to do. I think we that, could certainly do that. Sure. Um, because I, I mean, I think that there's a real benefit or a real opportunity right now to educate people about how these things are working. I was standing by one, and somebody said, "Well, why is it solar? Why do we need a solar-powered garbage can? What's that do?" And so, just because I knew what was going on, I said, "Well, it, this is what's happening, and it, mm -hmm. it might be nice to say that on the can container." But okay, how Sorry. much uh, this program was started before I got back on the council? How much do these things cost? The single units run about twenty nine hundred bucks, and the double units are thirty nine hundred, I believe. And the lifespan? Um, at least ten years. Okay. A lot of the cities that are using these. Get a small fraternity boy in one of these, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, pretty small. You didn't the say that. <laughs> some of the some reason. of the cities and uh, different um, communities that are using these too, you can get them customized and have side panels with advertising. You know, if we wanted to look at selling advertising or you know that type of thing, we could put our own message on there. I mean, what is the uh, uh, the compacted, full compacted weight. Do you know when the the typical setup? I think they said it's about forty five pounds once everything's compacted. It depends on what goes in it, and that can be adjusted up or down. But they they basically set it at forty five pounds, I believe it was. So you know, if you had different folks working them, you know, servicing them. They wanted to make sure that everybody could handle the weight and, and that type of thing, but they can be adjusted up to take more. So you'd think at least 50% or 100%, it will, it what, will handle twice as much? One of these units will handle what four to six normal ones will handle. Okay. All right. Gary. Yeah, one of the reasons we looked at this is uh, you see in some of the larger cities you see these. Um, it's hoping to do a couple of things. One, uh, downtown, those uh, trash containers are serviced on the weekends as well. So if we could make that more efficient, that would help. Uh, would reduce the amount of time staff has to go down and just lift can lids or sometimes you come in and it's overflowing farmers market in those situations and again it's a bit of a novelty and we hope that people will <coughs> use them more because it's something new and um, if they're lucky enough to be standing next to it when it compacts it's pretty cool um, but the idea is to try and encourage their use and also to cut down on the amount of times they need to be serviced. I get it shaped like goats like they have it have in Spokane where kids, kids want to shove garbage in them. I'm, I'm really excited that we're getting recycling containers downtown. That's the part of this that I like the most because, um, you know, for at least the seven years that I've been on council, we've been talking about, you know, having sort of a, discussion back and forth about whether or not we can get recycling downtown and it's nice to see a step in that direction yeah there are a little bigger units as you can tell but still if they take the place of four to six cans especially in the downtown area where it's congested the more stuff you can get off the street the better and also if they're throwing their recyclables in the recyclable side it may take up more than four to six because those containers aren't going in the trash mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Cool. Yep. Well, thank Thanks. you. Like Thanks very much. Like and the last report that we had is the Moscow Farmers Market canning grant and schedule with Kathleen Burns. She a little look surprised. of surprise there. <laughs> Would you like to delay? And the, the winner part? is Kathleen Burns. No. I'll go. Oh, you're, you're Bring you up to speed, you're going to be talking about the farmer's market canning grant schedule. Yep. So we've established, <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's okay. We started our schedule, and this last Saturday we did um, Tayberry Jam and Raspberry Jam at 10 o'clock at the market. And Barry and I were the demonstrators. Our regular jam person was off getting married, so we had to pitch in and. She was jamming. We were jamming. Um, so. The neat thing about the ball canning grant is we've received it two years in a row. Um, 
they sent us a canning unit last week that had a retail value of like $300, which is amazing. So we actually uh, water bathed in this electric unit and then also did the water bathing with our propane that we had purchased last year from the previous grant. So we did two styles of um, jam. I did the old school with the pan and the ladle. And we borrowed uh, DJ's Jam Maker and did the automated, automated method. And then we canned them in the canner. So we had a lot of people watching. We gave away a lot of prizes. And it was a lot of fun, and people got to taste jam. We were hoping to save um, a jar of jam for our mayor, but that didn't happen. So he's out a jar of jam. But uh, we canned eight pints. So it was really fun. And Akeley Berry donated the um, berries from Hermiston, didn't charge us, which was wow. really quite nice. So next week. There were some good looking berries this week at the yeah. farmer's market. Yep. Oh my gosh. And they were flying. And cherries. Cherries, cherries too. Cherries are $3 a pound, and at Winco, they're three sixty five. Wow. So pay attention to pricing. Yeah. No advertising. Please. No, not at and all. And the apricots look good too. Yeah. New apricots. What's the price yeah. of apricots? I didn't buy any, so oh. I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> but next week, um, they also sent us a food saver. And um, it's like a graduated seal a meal. And so we're going to be marinating meat. Marinating on what? Meat. And then the weekend after that, which is July 5th, we're going to do a salad in a jar, which is a glass quart jar, like a ball jar. And the uh, saver has an uh, um, air extractor. Have you ever worked with that? Mm -hmm. I haven't. So Barry's demonstrating that one as well. And then we're going to do another canning demo on the 26th of July and then two more events in August. So it's kind of fun. So lots, That's of, fun fun lots of events. That yeah. sounds great. Uh, yeah, people love it. I mean, it's, it's surprising the amount of people that have not learned how to preserve food. And would like to. And would like, like to. to. <laughs> yep. So if forget the mayor, you could bring uh, a jar of jam right here and we could uh, I could have done that, yeah. Could have. Uh, sorry. You also uh, provide information as to where if they choose they could purchase this stuff. Yes, without? we distribute a lot of coupons and so they have case prices um, and we send them to Tri State Winco. I think MBS even has jars. Yeah. Yep. So okay. we send them out. Well, if you do another um, canning report yes. to an administrative committee sometime in the future, I just want to let you know that the chair would be very welcoming of samples. Okay. What time during the farmer's market? We always do it at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock. Possibly some homemade yeah. bread. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it takes how long? How long uh, you know, it took about 20 minutes to actually create the jam and then another 30 minutes to can. So you do it just that's one time and then mm -hmm. that's, that's done. Yep. That's and then we did tasting, sure. you know, because we had a half a jar. You, how many did you actually do? Eight. Eight, okay. Eight yep. pints or, or half pints? Pints. Mm -hmm. Half pints or pints? You did pints. pints. Yeah. Great. And we did cool. tayberry and raspberry. Very good. So, and Tayberry, is, is that the blonde one? No. Or is that the Tayberry, which I'd never had before, is kind of a mix of a berry between a blackberry and a raspberry. Oh, okay. And he only has them for like two weeks. Hmm. And they're real hairy. Hairy Tayberry? Yeah, they really are. But it didn't matter in um, processing jam. They were great. Great. Yeah. Yummy. Good taste. Fun. Well, thanks for the report. I believe Thank that you. is the last report on the agenda, so I will declare us adjourned. Thank you.